So James, uh, James Golden, welcome to the Whole Man Academy podcast episode something. Um, we're racing through the podcast episodes now so quickly that I've kind of lost track of um, at what point they'll be released. Um, so first question is, how are you today? How am I today, Anthony? Well, it's Friday and we are in the midst of, uh, as you know, a lockdown in our normal lives. So head spinning a little bit off this week. We're adapting to our new... Um, Sort of regime and routine in life so i'm okay we've survived and yeah. we will um will this will make us uh, this will make us stronger in the long run so yes, there's, there's very the different from my normal routine of life well i know we we uh we oh, messaged well. each other briefly before we uh before we started recording and um and you'd said you had a bottle of wine in the fridge ready for this evening okay. so for people I mean, that don't know you've got four kids i i've got two but you've got four so you're, you've uh, done better than me there um but it is tough at the moment because everybody's stuck indoors. So how is it for you? Well, I try and see the positive from any challenging and negative situation. And from, me, from my perspective, I'm getting more family time. It's out of the norm. It, we're not on holiday. We're not, uh, we're not sort of taking some um, volunteer time off. This is kind of, you know, just, just come at us at an angle we didn't expect. So we're adapting to it and we're just finding a way, but we're having fun. We're just trying to keep the children entertained. Thankfully the sun has come out to, uh, to help us out this week. Yeah. So that's made life easier. And living in the country now, we can, in get, you know, we can actually get out to, into the countryside and just yeah. get a bit of fresh air. No, uh, we but trying to keep to some sort of routine has been the challenge because we're quite routine as a family. I'm very routine as a, as a person. And that's been the, the challenge is so the, the utmost respect to school teachers because I have no idea how they can <laughs> team yes. with, with, with little people. I it's know. not easy. Well, well we're, we're, we're uh, going to come back to being a dad as a, as a topic a little bit later. Um, but you're, you're on here mainly to talk about your, your role uh, working in fitness. Um, yeah. and, and we always send the, the guests a, a few questions beforehand, then we kind of pick some important points. And one of them is that you've always been interested in sport from an early age. So tell me about that. When did it all start? Uh, well, for me, I guess I just grew up with a sporty family. So it was kind of then encouraged from my parents that um, sport was kind of ingrained into me, really. So I just had a huge kind of um, energy and um, I guess, support from family towards sport. So, and frankly, I was, I was always just, I just wanted to play sport all the time. I'm from sort of a, a family that we just wanted to be outdoors and was kicking a football at the age of you know, four or five. And then it just carried on for me. So sport was a big part of my childhood and sort of growing up through life. And then I just took that forward into my teens and it was always going to be something that I would like to do for, 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 for my career. So obviously to be a professional sportsman is the ultimate yeah. you know, to actually make a living and play sport. That's the dream. The next so, best thing for me when I was in my late teens was to, to actually work alongside the athletes and try and actually be involved in sport and make a career that way. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of carved the career, studied sports science and, and, and uh, moved myself into the fitness industry. Okay. So, so, you, so you did a, a sports science degree. Sure. Um, so at what point had you decided that, that, that fitness and sport was going to be your actual career as opposed to something, you know, a, a hobby that you really enjoyed? Um, GCSE year. Uh, when I was starting to work out some career path and you're starting to take the advice, it wasn't really something my parents necessarily supported because back then the, the career, the opportunities were limited. There wasn't many... Um, clear and present kind of roles that you could move into. So there was a little, little bit of conversation around, is this the right thing? Um, so I sort of researched and sports science was starting to, to become quite say, a course to, to do that could move you into working professional sports clubs, working with athletes. And that was kind of my passion. That's what I wanted to do at quite an early age. So probably at the age of 15, 16. Okay. was where I started to see opportunities there and started to actually, well, actually, that's where I would like to right. sort of move, move in that direction and see if I can make it work. And you said that, so, let, let's say, being a professional sportsman is the, I mean, for a lot of us, was the, is or was the dream. Um, of course. If, if you could have been a professional sportsman, what would you have been? Well, I have to say, football player is always the, you know, is always the dream, isn't it, for young kids growing up. Um, 
I think also for me, I, I, I probably played most competitively tennis. Right. Um, so tennis was probably one of the sports that I could have probably excelled in, um, but very difficult to do and a very, very small, finer, you know, small amount of people do crack it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, do you know what? I, I played every sport from, from cricket, athletics, football, um, and tennis were my main sports. But I have to say, scoring a goal in front of 30,000 people would be a dream. Yeah. <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a sort of childhood club QPR, that was, that was my dream growing up, really. Yeah. I spoke to um, uh, Ben Nunn, who's a professional footballer, on uh, Tuesday. Yes. And, I mean, he's, he's a defender, but uh, you know, he said that, that that feeling of playing in front of a, you know, even, even if it's a few thousand people, up to yes. you know, a lot. I, I think for me, the most I played in front of was was uh was about a thousand people and that was at the valley um and even then just with a thousand it sounded great so you can only imagine what it's like if there's you know when you're talking 50 60 thousand people um and what football team do you support well queen's park rangers and it's a family thing for us okay. so it's been one of those things where there was no choice yeah. um, <laughs> so literally we're all of all of our family from west london and QPR was the team of choice, and all of us, cousins, uncle, so all of us are QPR, big QPR supporters, yeah. and we were season ticket holders, and, and uh, used to go to a lot of the games when I was younger. Do you and get, I'll be get along now? Not so much. Since moving to the Cotswolds, we're further away, and life gets in the way a little bit on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock, not the opportunities that I used to have. Yeah. So now with family, uh, you know, attending football matches are very few and far between. So I haven't seen them this season. Um, I did go to a couple of games last year. Um, now Woody's going to be um, four in the summer, so he's getting closer. So maybe, maybe in the next two or three years, when he gets to a point, he, and if he gets interested in football, yeah. he'll be uh, he'll be a super hoop as well. So I'll uh, maybe we'll start going again. So poor old Woody, you've got no choice. Yeah. Like it or not, well, that's it, mate. <laughs> Well, from there, I know you've, I know you spent, was it, you know, roughly 20 years in health and fitness, which I know people, uh, when we, especially, you might sound young, but obviously you and I only look in our late 20s, um, of wise, mature, but still youthful. Um, yes. So for, for your 20 years in the health and fitness industry, um, I know yep. you said about, you know, different fads come along. Um, sure. you know, what's your thoughts on that? And how, how are you seeing the moment with the different fads of even the dieting as well as the fitness? Mm -hmm. I've kind of seen 20 years of, of change, really. So when I first got into fitness, there wasn't, it, it, there wasn't so many opportunities. I mean, health clubs have always been there. They're leisure centres, and then you've got the kind of the, the variations of different health clubs where David Lloyd created more of a rackets theme. Um, and then you've had sort of the various sort of members clubs like Fitness First and Holmes Place start to, 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 to evolve themselves in the sure. UK. So there's been different trends within those, and I've just seen lots of variation of group fitness concepts, lots of um, variations of approaches. Now you're very at this moment in time. We're very much into those kind of virtual classes as well. The Peloton has really um, taken off and become hugely popular. Certain things I've seen come and go, you know, not last much more than six months, 12 months. The one big thing that I got involved with in the early days was spinning right back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and that was something that was actually not, there wasn't a lot of confidence, I think, in, in actually how this was going to, did it have shelf life? Was it still going to be around in three or four years' time? And I was actually part of the, what's called the Johnny G squad that was um, sort of launching it in the UK. And we started off at Holmes Place. And they were the first to kind of take it on board. And it was literally just a little boom box and seven bikes in the corner of the gym. And it was like instructor, we'll get seven people on, 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 um, on, on the bikes and just perform a, a group fitness spin, a, a cycling class to music. Yeah. So we were kind of involved in that and people were just looking at it going, this is just not going to work. Mm. This is not going to take off, you know, cycling to music. You can't, you know, there's only so much a bike can do aerobics was you know you could move you could change you yeah. could do great by inside steps and all yeah. these other movements but in a bike you can't move this is this is not going to be this is not going to take off but it did gradually gradually you started to build feel this momentum and then classes become 10 then they become 12 then fitness first took it 
Right. Then it was starting to roll out across these um, these groups of, of health clubs, and then um, then it become you know, I would say the biggest thing that hit the group fitness timetable for many years, and it's still there today. And now you've got boutique studios that just offer spinning, and they pack yeah. them out. So in twenty years, spinning has been the biggest thing I've seen come into the industry, and it's here to stay. And it's evolved in so many different avenues, mm -hmm. i.e. I mentioned Peloton, and there's different other virtual forms of, of, uh, of, of so, cycling classes. Big for business. those who don't know what Peloton is, um, in a, a dummy's guide to Peloton. Mm -hmm. Well, it basically brings a spin class into your, in, into, into your home environment. Um, they are virtual classes where you have a specific bike and the technology to deliver a class but the classes they've created this real following and also a cult where they they deliver live classes and you can be involved with maybe 40 50 000 people all in this class wow. delivering it in your own environment so you don't have to leave your house go through the process of parking your car getting and change going to the gym getting onto your bike and yeah you know, getting class. you now can just have your bike wherever you want it whether it be in your garage or in your office at home and you can do your your home workouts. So they've brought it into, they've brought a real life spinning class to you. And it's, it's, it's very smart. Good um, timing you're when you're about to be self-isolating. Their, their, uh, their sales, I'd imagine the last two or three weeks have, have ramped up quite soon. Yeah. So it's probably been quite good for them. So for you yourself, would you be a, if you had to do a, a class or if you could only do one yes. class for the rest of your life, would it be spin or would it be circuits? Well, I've come away from the sort of group fitness. I, I, was, I was a master trainer in group fitness for quite a few years in my early days. Too old for it now. Um, I still write some group fitness concepts and, and create some classes for, 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 for different clubs. Um, but HIIT training for me is always, you know, that's 100 years, proven concept. Bring the heart rate up and recover. Yep. Bring the heart rate up and recover. And you can change that in various ways. You can be very interested. And you've seen lots of HIIT concepts now create be created over the last sort of three four five years with different styles um using classes or straightforward body weight and f45 and digmia too that are, that, are, that are quite popular in london at the moment yeah. and surrounding areas so for me hit can be so you can be so versatile and you can create what suits you so you mm. create different forms of intervals and you can select the movement the exercises that are specific to you as a person because ultimately there is never my philosophy has always been there's never one size fits all approach yeah. so we can't just go into one um group fitness class and expect it to service everybody because some of them are just too um aggressive and high intensity for certain people but the whole like whole idea of hit is you work your heart rate up you drop it down you can make it as intense as you like so i think hit training is always the, the one that's going to yeah. be a winner for me okay so it's as you say, you don't necessarily have to have loads of equipment. Um, you don't need loads of space and you don't need a load of time. That's right. And th there is no, there's no set, set parameters on it. Like you say, time, we can, we can get away with a good, effective 20 minute, 30 minute interval based workout. That's very simple. We yeah. can do it at home. We can do it at home with certain exercises that, that, that suit us and they can effectively get the heart rate into those training zones that optimize what goals we want to achieve. So, yeah. uh, so the, with the, the sort of choices are, are, are vast with, with HIIT training and interval training generally. With a, with a guy that's listening to this who maybe is not, not into his fitness at the moment or is looking to get into it, what kind of advice would you give for, for getting started with fitness? Well, I think ultimately there's always a foundation that's got to be established first. So if we took the word fitness and just broke that down and what it means. Everyone's perception of it would be slightly different. For me, it's understanding those five key components. So cardiovascular, so our, our respiratory system, heart and lungs, how well they perform when we start to exert ourselves. So ultimately, we've got to be able to, to improve that with what we do. Yeah. Uh, but we don't want to overexert. We don't want to challenge the body in a way that it's not going to cope. We've got to work in our, our guidelines and where our sort of um, parameters are. So it's establishing where those are first and foremost and building on that. Then we're looking at how strong somebody is, their strength. If we don't exercise our body, if we don't 
uh, that will have a knock on effect of our well-being as well so I'm always kind of encouraging people to to engage with some level of strength conditioning program that doesn't need to be anything too fancy uh, we don't need to be you know swinging kettlebells over our heads we can yeah. use body weight for that you know innovations like TRXs have been great as well talking about innovations uh, I think again one of the greatest bits of kit that have come mm. onto the market in the last decade um, our flexibility a lot of our lives a lot of our time in life can be spent at a desk because of our work commitments yeah. so we lose the, the elasticity and the movement in our hamstrings our back becomes pressurized so we don't move as well um, so again we might not be engaging our core our motor skills you know, all the messages come from our brain and our endurance so you're looking at kind of all those little elements of what yeah. makes a fit and healthy body and then i'd always try and encourage someone to work out what what's what, what the goals are and then try and create a bit of a, a regime routine that fits mm. and do things that are fun i was going to say i remember we do things we obviously spoke together at an event in um back in january with uh with uh, ed draper the sky sports presenter at dalesford and i remember what right. you said there was which uh, you know, had people nodding their head is find out, find what you enjoy. Correct, yeah. I've always had that, um, that approach with, with anyone I've worked with, or any, anyone where I've provided advice to, is to, to do what you enjoy. If you don't enjoy going into the gym environment, um, you feel like you have to, but you don't have to. You can find ways of actually exercising your body without being in the gym environment if it's not where you enjoy being. Yeah. So I always encourage people to find out what we're not, when there, there are so many methods and we're not all engineered the same way and there's different approaches find the approach that really mm -hmm. satisfies your needs and makes you feel good about it i remember when before we moved up to the cotswolds we had a a, a really big virgin active gym very very near our house which i used to go to a lot and there was a really big park right next door and they'd launched a whether it's still going like a green gym so it meant you know getting out and they would be doing exercise whilst doing bits of gardening and yeah, for the average person, I loved going to the gym and could go every day for an hour sure. quite happily. But at least for other people that I knew, they would say, you know, you're, you're doing some exercise, getting the heart rate up. But, you know, the thought of being in the gym with a load of other people filled them with dread. Yeah, I mean, we're, in, we're probably in the minority there when it comes to actually enjoying a gym environment because I've always enjoyed the gym environment. It's, it's, some, it's, a, it's a little bit my sanctuary. It's my little escape. Yeah. Um, probably not so as a as I've got older and family, you, I, I probably am less um, efficient now. And so I, I, I was spending less time there, probably more efficient with the time, sorry, but spending less time there or enjoying it. So my workouts are typically 40, 45 minutes, where once upon a time I could easily do two hours. Yeah. So, you know, two hours for me now is not, um, not yeah, even doesn't work, not when you've got kids. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And you know what? I don't have the concentration like I once did to do mm -hmm. it. So my goals are different. So we're all moving along a conveyor belt where life is going to change a little bit. So we're not, um, you know, I don't think everything stays the same. And are you, let's say you're in the gym and you've got, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a magical time where you actually get some time alone and you're going to go to the gym for an hour. Are you listening to podcasts, music? Is it silence? Where is it for you with what works? It's changed for me, actually. I was always, once my time, probably a bit more social. Yep. Um, and headphones I always found sort of the antisocial so, and, and I think now because my workouts are quite sharp and I just like to get them done um, I often have my headphones on I use the time I almost doubled the time up and try and maximise it I've got into podcasts in the last mm, two to probably this year I yep. started around December time listening to podcasts first off in the car and now I've taken those podcasts into my headphones in the gym um, but prior to that I've always kind of been one one to have music on but now the music's become podcast so i've kind of changed how, yeah. how i go about it what about um, podcast what are you listening to i listen to a mixture actually um we mentioned you mentioned ed draper because i know ed personally i do listen to his sport and life i've listened yeah. to quite a few of those and i've the bbc uh watch them into podcasts and um, they just got launched one match of the day, so I just started listening, listening to that because I do have a, a real interest in football. I still switch on to some fitness podcasts, but my life is very often. Sometimes I like to experience some different um, topics being discussed. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm really just. I'm all, 
So, but the BBC have got one at the moment. I'm listening to it. It's called Manhunt. <laughs> so it's right. totally off the beat. It's called Manhunt, and it's like a, a detective. He, he's the uh, what's what was he was he was a I don't say he's a public figure, but he was on a TV show. It was called Hunted. I never watched it. Right. I heard it advertised on BBC, and essentially the guy's trying to work. You know, trying to there's a, there's a uh, a guy that's been on the run for 15 years, and he's trying to track him down personally. He's okay. a retired detective. Okay. Very interesting. So I'm, I'm episode eight of ten at the moment. So that's it's funny that, though, what what you can you know on podcasts now. There's such a random selection that you know everyone yeah. can find a little podcast that covers a niche that maybe other people will, won't find interesting i actually saw that advertised today um because there's there's so many podcasts coming out um well, the one I just were, if, if you were listening to music what kind of music would you be listening to in the gym uh, I'm, old, I'm old school anthony I'm, st I'm still stuck in the late 90s early 2000s mate so ah. i'm re always reminiscing <laughs> i like you know as you, as you sort of like you do get older uh my kids listen to some and I just stick to my kind of R and B and my garage from back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still there with me. I'm still kind of like in those days, in those party modes. Whatever for you. Yeah. So, now, what, yeah, it's, I, I remember you consulted. For, you consulted for the government on fitness. Um, so, <laughs> what did that entail for you? That was a really interesting time because um, I was based in London. I was looking after uh, some private clients, and I was involved in uh, the sort of the, the sort of, if you like, the, the I'd say that the explosion of spinning into the UK. But I was, but it was starting to really take off, and I was a master trainer for for, for the concept of spinning, and I used to teach it at shows, and then I actually took a, a job role. Um, that was directly working for the government. So it was based at the Treasury. They had converted the part of the Cabinet Office and part of the Treasury into a very nice kind of fitness club within. And they needed consultants to work within it. And um, so those that, that took, a, took a job role there. And then we started to actually work directly with sort of the, the um, health and um, sort of health department on our approach to fitness so we used to spend we used to have regular meetings about how, uh, how we can help the population how we can inspire and our ideas and it was it was fun i had two years the sort of if you like working directly with their fitness club and uh, the just service the civil and there was about there was a few thousand of them that worked within the um, the treasury and uh i had the sort of pleasure of, of work with some peas personally as in their sort of fitness trainer so it was fun it was a good, good good couple of years there it taught me a lot met some interesting people and it was a really interesting uh, time in my my fitness career i guess it's a good good stepping stone um and then was it that you moved on to working with professional athletes i i did i did some work with one particular athlete athlete personally that was alongside that job role right actually. okay um and then my my vision was always to create my own i sort of always had this kind of desire to do my own gig really and um then i started i left that job role because i then started to explore op options on actually creating a little fitness club of my own so i wanted to create something that was um a little bit like a say a, a, a small sports science clinic but it helped people achieve their goals yeah so the name of the club was called target and I wanted people to achieve their targets at the club that I set up. So I started then to work on that business plan. When I really started to work on it, and by that time I'd got reached a point where I was pitching for investment. So I was one of the first to qualify for what was called a, um, it was called, back then it was called a small firm loans guarantee. So it became the enterprise finance loan guarantee. So it was an entrepreneur's scheme to raise money for um, business ideas. Yeah. So, I wanted, so I wanted to create something that was small, a very kind of, concept-based fitness club that help people to achieve their um their objectives so we looked after people individually we worked on small numbers and we offered everything it was like a one-stop shop where we had a small yoga studio it had that private training area um we had a physio clinic we had another area where we where we delivered group fitness classes like hit and um some other uh, strength conditioning classes as well. So I opened that club in 2010. 
Right. So it was a very sort of um, challenging time because I was setting up a business then. I'm changing from what I'd always done to actually going into running a business. So I took some private investment. I'd invested money of my own and I had a, a bank uh, loan that supported me and we got it off the ground yeah. and we opened it. And we opened it. So and what was it like going from you know, the, being an employee to suddenly mm. kind of trying to run your own business? Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you, I guess I didn't really look in the rear view mirror much. It was all about uh, learning. I had a mentor that supported me with opening the club. So I had someone I felt kind of quite, um, I felt I had good guidance and I, and I wasn't going into it blind. I knew it was going to be challenging. But the, it was much more challenging than I could have imagined because you're learning new things. Right. You, yeah. You're not you're not naturally um, educated that way. So so you're learning the hard way sometimes with making decisions and they're not always the right decisions in hindsight. And you, you learn from those mistakes. And you're starting to employ people and you're and you're managing people in a different way because I've managed a health club in London prior to this as well. So I'd have management experience, but it's very different when you're running your own and you know, your own business. And you're starting to build a team, yeah. And you, you, you're starting to you're wearing multiple hats all the time. So I'm the fitness trainer there. I'm essentially now kind of the managed director of the company, and I'm building this business that's starting to to move in a way that it, it, it's like a treadmill that you're running at. You're turning on at 18 kilometers an hour, yeah. And it's constant. <laughs> you can't really switch it down. So yeah. It was, I mean, we learned a lot from the, the experience where we, we, we extended the club further. We had good times. We had mm. some brilliant staff. And um, we had lots of challenges on the way, like any business. You have to pivot. Like now, business is having to pivot just in a way that never, never would have anticipated. I mean, I, I, mean, I absolutely um, really feel for a lot of the small businesses out there because it's so tough at this moment in time. So, so yeah, I had the um, best part of eight years in uh, owning a fitness club. So learn, learn a hell of a lot from it. From, from what you've learned, if, if a guy's thinking of starting a, and it doesn't really matter what small business, but maybe let's just say, let, let's pick the fitness industry. Um, yeah. What kind of advice would you give a guy who's going into the fitness industry? I think, I think trust, trust yourself. You know, make decisions and based on you, you really believing in, and believing and believing yourself. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's tough. It is not something you can go into and just fully expect to get everything right. I think you've got to expect to get things wrong yeah. and learn from those mistakes. That's the important thing. If you can learn from them and if you continuously make them, I don't think you know, yeah. business is probably right for you if you can make the same mistakes over and over again. So but I think you've got, you, you, you're going into, going into it knowing that this is going to be very challenging in a way that you're, you're, you're out of your comfort zone. Getting that work-life balance for me was always the, was, was the difficult thing because when I set the company up, I never had children. By the time the company was really reaching a point where it scaled up and I had you know, a relatively big team, I had family, wife, and we, you know, all of a sudden you're trying to find that balance. And that was one of the biggest challenges of, of my life at that point. Yeah. So not being able to actually probably give everything to the business because all of a sudden the, the family need my time and it's trying to work out how you, how you strike that balance. Yeah. I guess what I've seen from guys who are maybe our age uh, or, or I should say that starting a business with a family, it's a lot easier when it's just you because yeah. if you want to work, you know, 20 hours a day, uh, sleep could, in the office, sleep in the gym and just, it's not going to affect anyone else. Yeah. No, but You're when not it, trying you to, know, keep people happy at home um yes i think for you know moving out to the countryside is one of those things also that actually you're you're supposed to be moving out to have a slightly more uh, balanced life with family um but it is finding that especially at the moment where people are pivoting that you do need to put in the long hours um it can be it can be an interesting conversation to have with your partner yeah yeah no, sure thing i mean we we look back at it and it was a, it was a massive learning experience and we learned so much from it. And I, mean, I, I, I couldn't have sat in, uh, you know, I couldn't have studied a business degree and, and learn what I did because I made mistakes. I managed a team. I built, I raised money. 
Um, and I kind of built a business that had, had some substance to it. You know, we've gone through the whole journey of, of, of building a fitness club. And I always kind of had the, the vision. It's, it's the journey and the roadmap along the way. You've got to pivot. You've got to be able to adapt. Things don't stay the same. And that's something I'd always give people advice to, that things do not. It doesn't go the way you always think it's going to. You're yeah. always going to have to work out some different um, routes along the, along the journey. And but that, it's fun and you've got to enjoy it. You've got to put a smile on your face. Because it, can be, it can be very, very challenging and tough mm -hmm. and gruelling at times. That's yeah. how, um, going on to actually talking about having kids, I mean, for you, say, having four children, and we've both, both of us have recently had a, a little baby as well, and we know how much that um, impacts on everything. So how is it for you from going from one to two to three to four children? We're trying to keep that balance of social life, work life. Yeah. Well, I think, let's say, let's say if, if we were still, I say we, my, my, my wife and I are very much a partnership and we form a very kind of strong bond and we do everything together. You know, we're very collective. And um, if, we had, if we were still in the business today, we probably wouldn't have extended our family like we have. We made a decision. The business wasn't working. We, we got out of it uh, three years ago. Yeah. And we wanted to change direction in our life. It's quite sometimes a brave thing to do, but we just wanted some new focus. It was for us. I've been in fitness for a long time. I had some you know, very, I've looked after some very high profile clientele. Uh, explored, which we decided this was where we wanted to be, i.e. the Cotswolds. So we started to look at uh, an adjustment in our life to move here. And it enabled us to think about extending our family, which we did. So to, to four, when we had two, we really genuinely thought we were, you know, that was life complete. And then third, I have to say, it was, wasn't planned, but it was super amazing. And you know, number three come along, it was great. But we never shut the door on number four. So mm -hmm. moving to the Cotswolds, we, we, never, we never see that coming. If we, if, you, if we rewind five years, sometimes you, you, know, you have a plan. This is what things are going to look like in five years. Sometimes they don't. But four children, it's like, it's a bit of a, a dream sometimes. But it's fantastic. Love it. We're very, you know, we love, family for us is, is our life. And uh, we don't have that kind of uh, live to work approach we work to live now so a little bit different so we're not we're not we're not being driven by a business so we now um we now work in a way efficiently that services what we need in terms of a lifestyle yeah. and we have happiness so, what's the best thing about being a dad the best the best thing um i think just i mean every day coming home through the front door and just seeing their faces when they run up to you dad i mean it's amazing yeah. Um, and just seeing them grow and develop. And my, all of my energy and time now is dedicated to seeing those guys prosper. And I want them to be, you know, that I want them to, to um, fulfill their dreams in life. And that's, that's, that's my role in life now. I want them to be the best versions of them. It would be cliche, yeah. but, and I just want to support those guys. I think we've got, you know, Sophie and I very much, like, like I mentioned before, we, we do everything decision making as a partnership. And, um, the children are very much just everything in our life so well on on having everything everything, everything about being a father is <laughs> of course you need a little bit of breathing space from time to time just and to just feel like a human and feel like an adult yeah. whether it's just date night or whether it's just that you and i go down the pub for a beer yeah. you need that time so let's but, let's talk about that then as a having again you know a a, a busy career and four kids and a partner how yep. would you for, for guys if, even if they haven't got kids but especially those that have what advice would you give for them to keep a keep a good relationship going when you've got a lot of other stuff to deal with mm. i love it's teamwork and making sure that you guys are you know as, as a family are very much on the same on the same page with decisions and you know you share the same visions we like to do things together as a family um, we do, you know, we we do everything where we can as a family. Yes, we like to get our little escapes. I think having those little escapes, i.e. Sophie and I have 
a date night once a month. Mm-hmm. Not at the moment, probably not for the next couple of months. We, we're yeah. desperately going to need it, need yeah. it by the time <laughs> we get through this, this uh, time in our life. And we just, we just make sure that we have time for each other. You know, we do things together. And um, I think that's important. You create a partnership when you, when you sort of come together. Mm-hmm. And when you have children, I think it's making sure that you kind of share the same values and you install just getting the basics right. You know, yeah. Lots of love, lots of love and laughter in our house. That's, that's important all you, for me. That's all you need. Um, and, yeah. and cash. Um, so how, yes. how did you yeah. meet Sophie? How did we meet? So we met at a friend's party. So we were um, attending a friend. Well, I say Sophie was friend of a friend that was invited to the party. My best friend was having a um, bit of a gathering for a party. And when we met each other and we had brief conversation, didn't go much further than that. And then subsequently she actually stalked me on Facebook, Anthony. So she, <laughs> she, <admitted it. laughs> she, she, she tracked me down on Facebook and she, yeah. she started messaging me. So therefore... She started to, yeah. She made the first moves, and then that was it. We 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 met up, and then did again. Straight never looked back. Sorry, Miss Anthony, say again. Instead of getting any kind of restraining order, <laughs> yeah. I know. What is this strange? I looked. I looked at the profile picture. So this girl was talking to her at my mate's party. Right. So where, where was she coming from here? Anyway, it was it was literally. Honestly, we went out first date. And she said she wasn't sure about me first time around. I was pretty sure. Went out for a second date, and the rest is history. And we've been together ever since. And we are um, we are best 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 mates, and we do everything together. Well, since then you've obviously as you say you've you've moved up to Cotswolds, which is a big um, a big change for uh, the whole family, and now sure. working in Dalesford. So tell us about Dalesford and kind of your role there. Well, Dalesford's always been sort of our. Um, it's a little escape when we had our business we always used to come to the Cotswolds for our little retreat weekends um we used to do little breaks here four or five days and Dalesford was always our kind of little go-to you know we used to go there for brunch in the morning and we've seen it kind of evolve over the last yeah. 10 years yeah it's grown a lot hasn't it yeah and we moved to the Cotswolds to explore new opportunities I was still commuting was of course in London I had a uh, I've got a lot of um, I, I consult for a project in London. I look after some clients in London. So I was always going to have the mindset we would, I would be commuting while staying a couple of nights a week. I did as far director at Dalesford. I wanted to, to kind of create a presence here and, and sort of build my sort of fitness services in the area. And I had a conversation with a spa director and they were, um, they're looking to expand i can't tell you too much on this podcast about where the the project's going but they are expanding as they've been doing over the last sort of decade Mm -hmm. and they've brought me in as the fitness consultant there so i have my own studio and i've created a fitness service that i didn't have so we started i started there um, and we started to offer a health and fit a, a fitness training service yeah so the hay bar which is at the back of the the actual farm and the restaurants it's the most beautiful spa environment where it's got two yoga studios and it's got a pilates studio but it's also there's also another private studio so i've basically taken over so i now run this fitness service this private studio on the first floor and it's worked very well it was almost a, a suck it and see and see if there's an uptake a year on i have a waiting list for my services there it's all gone very well i'm now starting to transition from my work commitments in London and I'm working very much 70% of my working week at Dalesford. Yeah. So we explored the opportunity and it's worked out for both of us. So um, so I'm very pleased. uh, And you've got an app as well, which I know you allow some of your clients to, to access. So how does that work? That's right. So I have a private app that I, um, that I've created. I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing to um, just, just so you know, I'm moving around that here. Right. I'm just plugging my device in because, as you know, if the iPhone gets a lot of um, activity, the battery starts to. Yep. To make it okay, we're back on. So I look after just a just a handful of clients with me, and I deliver a premium coach service, I call it, and it essentially just connects us together. So what it does, it gives the opportunity or me the opportunity to help their lifestyle i.e. through the nutrition and just giving them the 
the, the support and the guidance with that day to day. So if you're training, if you're, if you are a fitness trainer that's training someone once or twice a week, we all know it's how that person is going to live their life around it. You know, if they have 160 odd hours in the week to maximize that time spent you know, in the gym or whatever they may be doing towards their goals. So I've created, I've basically got an app where I, where I, it, it, it's, it, it allows us to have a, uh, a platform where I can service them outside of the training sessions. Sure. So it just gives the service a little bit more of a, an air of my time and a little bit more sort of, I think, um, where, where someone needs that advice and guidance. So it's not just, we, here's a training session, well done, I'll see you next week. Yeah. You know, I'll train yeah. people, on a re- not just on a regular basis, but I'll try and give them as much support and guidance with regards to the nutrition and their... James, you just lost the sound a minute. Oh, sorry. Are you that's back the, on? That's the one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Right. Um, and I think where I just just mentioned there, and and they're also hosting some healthy food workshops at Balesford in conjunction right. with the cookery school. Yeah. So essentially, alongside the head chef there, we we now create a workshop that's got that whole kind of focus on healthy food. Yeah. So this is again where where people do sort of fall down a little bit they, they, they may be quite focused in what they do in the gym but sometimes they want the results from that but it's how they kind of service it with the food they eat and um how they live their lifestyle are they drinking too much alcohol etc so but um i create quite a sort of simple philosophy in life it all depends on someone's commitment and really what it wants to achieve but we've got to live a little little bit as well i know you, i remember you saying you know first it's it's for you it's kind of practice what you preach but it's one size doesn't fit all um it's it's always been my my focus is you know there's never or my my philosophy there isn't a there isn't a program there is no nutrition plan there is anything we can just say right this is going to this is works for everyone to work with it's going to work for you yeah Get off you go i'm going to charge you this fee and it's going to be the you know what, what exactly what you needed everyone's different mm-hmm. everyone's response is different and it's got we've got to look at first and foremost the individual what their objectives are and then create a, a, a bit of a, a plan, stroke program that's going to suit them. So, so how do we, you, um, let's say motivation for a client, yeah. and, and, and that really applied to, you know, a, a guy listening who, yeah. you know, maybe their motivation is, it's for all of us, it's peaks and troughs. But again, we love going to the gym and doing sports, so it's easy. But for guys yeah. that know they need to do it, but it doesn't particularly kind of float their boat, where, where do you work on motivation with people? Uh, again, I think we come back to just making sure that somebody is engaging with what they enjoy, and I think we're 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 encouraging them to do things because they need to do it, but they're not enjoying it. I just trying to work with people that actually, where's your enjoyment? Where's going to ins- what's going to inspire you? Yeah. And build on that because ultimately you need to build some some form of foundation first, and then you can start to maybe um, catch uh, a little bit more of a I think it's like creating that good trend. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen straight away. It's going to take you a number of weeks to sort of create a good routine, good trend, or breaking bad habits. So ultimately, it's sometimes it's some subtle changes. Yeah. If you can change a few little adjustments here and there, two or three of those, and all of a sudden, you know, you're starting to make a big change, and mm-hmm. therefore you can start to build on that. So well, I think that's a good point. And actually, we touched on some of this at the event we did at Dalesford. Um, could could you tell the guys really about the the event at Dalesford and, and, and what the re, uh, well why Dalesford were putting that on because it was their first ever event for men if I'm if I'm yes. correct. Well, how did this how did this come about and, and why we did it? Um, one, we have a very female orientated um, clientele that come yeah. to Hay Barn because it is naturally it's a, it's a spa. So, sorry, Anthony, say again. What kind of percentage do you think is uh, female to male? At the, at the uh, 90, 90% of our regular bookings at the Hay Bar is female. Wow, yeah. So we wanted to uh, increase our sort of male participation in events at the Hay Bar. So I was asked by the events team there, Would do I think there's uh, an opportunity for us to deliver uh, a, a, a male-only event? So I kind of pondered it. I thought, mm, okay. 
well we have we have a female audience where we can actually encourage them to invite their husbands along i said okay i know a few people that might be interested in supporting me yeah i.e one being you so you've had a good you've had brilliant you know you've got now experience and you, you're creating something brilliant in the whole man academy so that's where i approach you to, to support it and then it was a case of getting a date secure and starting to to build a bit of content so we went with the, the, the sort of the theme of how to take control yeah i felt if we were going to do something that was interesting without making it too there's a lot of stigma around that whole kind of you know mental health etc yeah. and put, put three good people in front of an audience i thought would have an interesting um little event so i yourself myself and ed were coming together as a as a, as a little um as a little team to, to talk in front of people and it started to catch on so we got a good number and we streamed it we had over 100 people streaming the event live yeah i couldn't make it and we had 16 people or 17 people in the room with we had, we had a, a, um, a maximum of 20 yeah so we did we did pretty well for the first time and considering we've never had that many males in the hay barn at one time yeah yeah that's a good point was a success we're out in the countryside so it's as opposed to being in london i mean we said our first event for the whole man academy in soho we only had 24 guys sure. um, so we know that you know one of the hardest things is 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 giving a guy enough confidence that he feels comfortable to come along to an event. Yeah. And, and I exactly spoke it. about this because we had, um, I was speaking to, I can't remember which guest it was, about that event and said we had a real mix of guys there from the chap who's in his 60s, who's got six kids and is a landscape gardener, through to young entrepreneurs and a mindfulness or yoga coach and, and a real mix. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's great because... It, you know that is sometimes the challenge it's getting getting males to to come together like that unless there's a reason for it i.e a sporting event or you know there's a there's a there's, a, there's an organized gathering we're going down the pub all to catch up you know, yeah. that that was the challenge it's like overcoming that stigma women are very good at doing it you know, they all get together post school drop off get together for coffee and there's no particular rhyme or reason for it they're just good at doing it um, with us guys, we're we're not so we're not so open about that, and it was that was always going to be the uh, the challenge. I think could we get enough interest or or, or break down that barrier where we could say we're going to do this Saturday morning, we're going to you know put anything up to twenty guys in a room, and you know what we're going to chat about how to take control around our health. Yeah, and we're going to have yourself, myself talking fitness. We're going to have Ed, who's a great broadcaster yeah, around great. sport. And it, 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 was, it was thoroughly enjoyable. And I think the feedback that I had from everyone that was in the room was, that was good fun. And that was a good Saturday morning. It was different. So, you know, if we do it again, I reckon we would have all those faces again, plus maybe some new people that, that may, well, um, may well want to come along yeah. and uh, see what, we're, uh, what, what, what well, it was actually, all about. So. Actually, the funny thing about it also was I, I only knew Ed, uh, Ed Draper through you and you, you know, you, you know him, but haven't known him for many years. Well, I didn't realize that his dad is my GP. Ah, yeah. I think I remember the conversation yeah. around this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was, it was great yeah. also that, you know, I, I was there to talk about the, let's call it the whole man, hand, the whole yeah. man side of things. You've got the fitness side and actually Ed knows a lot about health and fitness. Does, yeah. uh, so you know, he, he bought, as opposed to just being someone there to ask some good questions, he bought a lot of knowledge himself to the table. He did. Yeah, he did. He certainly does. He has a lot of knowledge around health and wellness. He's very uh, passionate about himself. Mm. And um, he's obviously, his, his big passion is sport. Hence, that's what he does for a living. He talks about it. Yeah. So we had a nice, um, we had a nice blend of, of personalities and, 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 and the background there. So it was, a, it was, it was, it was thoroughly enjoyable and the feedback I thoroughly enjoyed being part of it and um, the audience certainly provided me lots of positive feedback so um, it was fun well let's I mean that's the problem at the moment as seems we're recording this um, you know just as the country went into lockdown that you know all events are um, on hold for a while and I, sure. I wonder whether you know once it's not necessarily when lockdown you know, is uh, is released because I think people will still be wary. But I, I think that later in the year you'll see a real surge of events again, um, because you know there's 
there's a lot of interest in them, but obviously for, for the moment, none, no events can take place. Yeah. Well, this is going to challenge a lot of us as well in terms of our sort of mental resilience because yeah. we've, we've probably now, you know, we've always taken for granted, you know, just, just going down the coffee shop, you know, just being able to go out for a bite to eat, just going here at will. Yeah. You know, our freedom has essentially been, you know, taken away um, because we need to obviously make these uh, sacrifices and changes to our lifestyle to protect people's health at the moment. So it's a, this is something, this is unprecedented. And it's, you know, it's just, it's not something we've ever prepared for. Yeah. So it's going to be a big challenge to a lot of people in terms of their mental resilience and how they're going to uh, sort of overcome this because I think a lot of us can deal, I mean, me in particular, I can, I'm pretty good at dealing with facts and I can always deal, but with this one, we don't know where this is going to change. Yeah. So we're sort of yeah. taking each day as it comes at the moment. We're, we're, not, we're not at that point where we can say it's, it's peaking now. We can see light in the tunnel. So it's, it's us. we've spoken a lot on the podcast to, to the other chaps about uncertainty. Mm. It, this is probably the most uncertain time for a lot of us because we don't know when it ends. And, you know, we don't know how it's, if it, if, if, and it's likely to get worse and how it affects everybody. Sure. Um, and, and I guess for some of us up in the countryside, you can be in a little bubble because, you know, as long as you've got enough money to keep food coming to your door sure. and pay your bills at the moment, you're staying in and it, it doesn't seem that, you know, that much of life has changed apart from having a bit more time in your hands. But yes. for, for friends of ours that either live in Spain or Italy or London, yes. especially that live in apartments, um, they're the people that you really, you wonder how the coping mechanisms could be very important yeah. in the weeks ahead. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I mean, you definitely do. Uh, you, you make a lot of, I don't know, you in your head, you, you, you put yourself in other people's shoes and you think, how are they going to cope and how are they going to do that? with the way they live or you know whatever it may be so there's going to be a huge amount there's a real challenge out there for people um but what i do love is the british spirit and how we galvanize i don't know whether you was on your doorstep at 8 p.m last night i yeah, was out the nhs so i mean that that for me what seeing some of the, the fantastic um social media footage and my children were really into it last night our neighbors were all into it and then moments like will, will live with, live with me forever yeah. And I always think, I always believe that every cloud is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. And this is a really difficult, changing time. But there will be some good that will come out of it. Whether it be that we're just pushing the reset button on, our, on what, where we was in that hamster wheel of life at that point. Whether we can just kind of recalibrate ourselves. But I do believe that it might take us, you know, we, we might not see the good for a year, two years. Yeah. But... There's a reason for all of this, and um, it's it's going to really test us. But we'll, as human beings, and our British spirit will be stronger for it. And I'll tell you, we'll appreciate going for coffee. Yeah, uh, it will. It will bring that. Um, it's funny because I know today when I had spoken to Emma and and knowing that I was going to speak to you later, and it's weird how just for a little while you're still conditioned about the fact that you can be going out. Because I actually just for a moment in my head said to Emma. We, you know, we should invite you and Sophie and the kids around now the weather's improved. And then you're like, oh no, what am I doing? Like, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, sure. But we, we'll, we'll get there. Which leads me on to uh, the last question which we, we like to give people, which is, um, what advice would you give to a guy who's looking to do life better? Okay, so what advice would I give someone to, who's going to want to do life better? about just try and live your dream i think you know we've we've made a, we've made a change oh can you still hear i can i can hear you i can't see you yeah i've got you back there you are can you, can you see can you hear me i can i can see your lovely face sorry the, the beauty i mean the iphones you know just ah. touch the screen and all of a sudden. So I just tried to be clever and tried to look at something, but I shouldn't have done that. Um, so how, what advice can I give to actually give someone back? I think, do you know what? Follow your dream and believe in yourself because we always had a dream that one day we'd move to the Cotswolds. We always felt we'd be somewhere later down the line of life. 
and be brave. And I think, you know, you, you can change things. You can turn the corner. You're not, you, you're not set. Everything doesn't have to be set in, in the same way. You, you know, yeah. you, I think sometimes you, you do get sort of very stuck in a way that you're not happy with. So don't be frightened to change direction sometimes in life. You know, it's being brave sometimes and what, whatever you see to be what you, where you want to, to be in the next stage of life, then you, you can make it happen. Make it happen. Yeah. That's a, it's a really That's good point problem. because um, it's funny saying, you know, don't be afraid to change direction in life. We were speaking recently at one of the, um, one of the big banks and we spoke about, even as a CEO, don't be afraid to firstly admit you're wrong or pivot and you know either make a u-turn or move in another direction Um, and i guess for us guys sometimes it's hard to admit that we are uh, maybe uh, say either wrong or that things aren't quite working out for us but knowing that it's all right to say do you know what i'm gonna flip things and just go and do something completely different or move something completely different that's it so we we made we made the we made the move here coming up to three years ago and i have to say you know, three years on, it has been just for me personally and for my family has been just the perfect move for us as a family. It might not be for everybody, yeah. But we always dreamed it would, and it has, and it has lived up to that. Sometimes you can have that dream. You think, oh, I'd like to be there, or you know, like to relocate myself. And some people would like to live abroad. It doesn't always live up, but for for us, this has lived up. We can, you can always go back, you know, if it doesn't work out. But so we've yeah. um, we've thoroughly, it's worked for us. So I think for me, be brave with your decisions. Right. And you said it is li- live your dream. Um, that's it. I think you just give li- the title of the podcast. Right, life for living. Do have a smile on your face and be happy. Yeah, that's ultimately. Yeah, you know, it's not. This life is. You know, we're 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 put on this um, this planet to. I'm um, all about positive energy mm-hmm. and uh, do the things that make you smile. I like it. Well. I know you've got a cold bottle of wine in the fridge uh, wait, waiting for you. Um, sure so have. I, I I'm was... very disciplined. I do two drinking days per month. Right. Okay? I'm quite focused on my health and well-being, as you know, being in the fitness industry. Yeah. And, and today, even if I'd had my cheat days, I'm still going to have that bottle of wine because you know what? This week has been uh, very transitional mm. and Good way homeschooling, it. having four kids and a new baby that needs demands and... I don't know, just my alarm not going off in the way that it normally does and me not doing what I normally do. I need to, I need, I'm going to enjoy this bottle of wine tonight. <laughs> it's going to go down really well. A Friday night, a bottle of wine and a pizza. That's it. That's exactly what we're doing. Perfect. So, shout out to Oxford Pizza Abbey ones that we're going to, we're going to pick up our pizza tonight. I say we so, all need um, a little, uh, especially on a Friday night, we all need our little, uh, our little things that kind of you know, bring a bit of, bit of extra joy in our life. Um, well, we will let you go. We will say thank you very much for, for spending your time on the Homadic Academy podcast. And if people want to get in touch with you, where's the best place to find you? My website is um, thefitnesspro.co.uk. Uh, my Instagram is aka thefitnesspro. So uh, my, my name, the Fitness Pro, is, is, is kind of the, if you, if you like Joe Wicks, the body coach, yeah. James Golden's the fitness pro. Fair I've been 20 years. Can I call myself a fitness professional? Hopefully. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to think so. If I, I can work I'm... out how to do the show notes, I'll, uh, I'll put it on in there. But um, all right, well, James, we'll let you go. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us and we will speak to you soon. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, I hope there's interesting mate. content for you, Anthony. Cheers, Cheers. mate.